Archaeology Porn. Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Archaeology Porn, where I'm going to introduce you to some scintillating archaeological material. And for our very first episode, where better to start than the inspiration for the recent Indiana Jones film, The Dial of Destiny? What am I talking about? The Antithera Mechanism. And while the movie may have been a stinker, this object is hot, making it truly worthy of the title, Archaeology Porn. Archaeology Porn. Now let's talk a little bit about what this thing is. This is considered to be the world's very first analog computer. What's an analog computer? Well, I'm a wannabe archaeologist, not an IT guy, but I can try to explain it in simple terms the way I understand it. An analog computer is something that uses a continuously variable measurement or force, like fluid pressure. So fluid pressure exists on a continuously and infinitely divisible sliding scale. Between any two measures of fluid pressure, you can have a smaller measure in between. And it uses that to calculate something else, like the movement of a planet. Compare this with the type of computers that you and I know, which are digital computers. Those use digits 0, 1, 2, 3 that are discrete to calculate something, so they are not continuously variable. Now, what makes this antithera mechanism so outrageously prochronistic is when it was made, which was anywhere from 87 BC until 220 BC. Now, just to give you an idea of how crazy this is, it's made up of a bunch of wheels and gears like the inside of a clock. That type of technology was not known to have come about until the 13th century. So like 14 to 1600 years after this thing was made. And in terms of analog computers, the first of those came about in the 19th century. So about 2000 years after. One example, which I think may have been the first was made by Lord Kelvin. Now Lord Kelvin, if you know a bit of chemistry, you have a few different temperature scales. You have the ridiculous Fahrenheit one that we Americans use. You have the Celsius one, which is a lot more scientific, and you have the Kelvin scale, and that's what Lord Kelvin is most well known for. And he invented an analog computer, I think, to help predict the movement of the tides, and that, I think, is considered one of the first, and that was in 1873. So this thing was thousands of years ahead of its time. So what is the Antikythera mechanism? The Antikythera mechanism is a hand-cranked orrery. What's an orrery? An orrery is a mechanical model of the solar system showing stuff like the relative position and motion of the planets and the moons. So it can predict phenomena like eclipses. Now this one is so sophisticated that it even models in the irregular orbit of the moon. Anyway, it's all really complicated stuff that it's way above my pay grade to uh, explain. So I'm going to stay in my lane as a pretend archaeologist. It's in 82 separate fragments, probably only about a third of the original. And there are a whole lot of gears, the first ones which were noticed in 1902. So before we get into more specifics about how this thing may work, let's talk a little bit about how it was discovered. So in 1900, the year 1900, there were some sponge divers off of a small island called Antikythera in Greece. Now, they discovered a shipwreck, and they called the Greek Navy in to help them out. Now, that in itself is pretty amazing, because Greece only became independent in 1827. It had been dominated by the Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years. And in that first century of uh, independence, it was struck by war, constant coups and civil strife and overthrows. And the fact that the country, which was then very underdeveloped, 
could pony up the funds for a naval ship to do an archaeological excavation underwater, that says something a lot about the priorities of this country with its rich history and culture. And it turned out this wreck had major finds. It had marble statues, coins, ceramics, beads, musical instruments like lyres. Bring me a small lyre. Small lyre, small lyre. I didn't do it, I didn't do it. I wasn't even there. I was at a friend's house. The check is in the mail. Not that kind of lyre. It was literally a boatload of booty. And that's actually what made this thing difficult to figure out, you see, because it had so much different stuff in it. Uh, it was hard to tell where it was coming from and where it was going. And that kind of reflects the trade in the Eastern Mediterranean at that time. They didn't have ships that could sail for long, long distances out in the open water. So the thing that ships did is, let's say it was coming from the Levant or where present day Israel is. They would go all along the coast and maybe shoot out to Crete or to some smaller islands and go from one to the other, trading as they went along. So it was really difficult to tell the original course of the ship where it was coming from and where it was eventually bound. Anyway, in the initial investigations, the mechanism was kind of encrusted with the whole bunch of stuff that metal stuff gets encrusted with if it's under the water for a few thousand years. So it was kind of cast aside as nothing special. Now, there was one researcher, Valerio Steus, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who did in 1902 notice a wheel sticking out of the thing. But he just dismissed that as too prochronistic. In other words, he said, those types of wheels and gears, that stuff wasn't invented for thousands of years after. This was just some modern something or other that fell off a ship among the shipwreck. Nothing to worry about. And with that, the mechanism was locked away for decades in a dusty archive somewhere. And it wasn't until 1951 that it was rediscovered. So there was this British physicist, science historian, and Yale professor, Derek John de Sola Price. And he became interested in this object somehow and started researching. And pretty soon he realized there was more to this than what it seemed. A diamond in the rough. Now he published two papers on the mechanism one in 1959 and one in 1974. One of the things he was looking at was the descriptions on the different fragments they discovered. Price was aided in this by a Greek nuclear physicist named Charolampos Karakulos, who used X-rays and gamma rays to help make imagery of these very small inscriptions. So there are seven major fragments and 16 minor fragments that have inscriptions on them. And based on these, Price was able to propose a date of creation of 87 BC. Now that 87 BC date conflicted quite a bit with the carbon dating on the hull planking of the ship, which suggested that the trees used to make the planks of the ship, they were felled in 220 BC, more than a century before that 87 BC date. Now that also was complicated because it seemed to conflict with the dates of some of the coins that were found among the wreckage. So how as archeologists do we figure this out? Well, dating is an inexact science and it is something you have to triangulate. And what's hypothesized is that the planks used to make the ship were old by the time they were used to create the ship. So maybe they had been used in some other capacity for a while and it wasn't until somewhat later that they were used to form the ship. So that's how the different dating evidence might be explained. And that's a fairly common problem in archeology span as there are so many different ways of dating things scientifically now. This type of interpretation shows that why in archeology span the science isn't always settled and it actually requires some judgment and art applied to it. But we'll talk more about this when we get to our segment on dendrochronology and radiocarbon dating. Now, there have been a number of studies since that last one in 1974. In 2005, X-ray CT scans decoded the structure on the back of the mechanism. In 2008, more scans were done to look inside the fragments and see inscriptions 
where, which were not visible to the naked eye. In 2008, more scans were done that looked inside the fragments and all of that crusting and actually found other inscriptions. This is where that idea that there were 37 gears came from and also revealed some of the hidden functioning of the mechanism, like its ability to predict eclipses. Nice dissolve. Its ability to model the orbit of the moon and the fact that the Greeks actually knew that the moon has an irregular orbit, meaning its speed varies throughout that orbit. Now, it's 2023, and I didn't even know that, and the Greeks knew that more than 2,000 years ago. Amazing. Price was able to reconstruct a model of what he thought the mechanism looked like after his 1974 paper, and there were other models that came out thereafter. Michael Wright created the first actual working model in 2002, and there were other ones made throughout the 2010s, and I think the most recent one in 2021. These were greatly aided as more information became available as more and more scans were done with better and better technology. The most recent effort was conducted by scientists from the University College London, UCL Heyo, who uh, used a computer modeling to create a 3D model of the whole structure, which they hope to recreate physically using modern methods. Now, as I've said, the mechanism is really beyond the comprehension of most normal people who are not astronomers and well beyond my ability to explain. But here are some of the key features of this thing. It shows the ecliptic. That's the orbital plane of the Earth around the sun. The 12 signs of the zodiac. The months and days of the Egyptian calendar, even including leap years. Lunar and solar pointers indicating the location of the moon and even its acceleration and deceleration throughout the orbit. It also predicted solar eclipses and tracked the Natonic cycle, which is a 19-year period encompassing 235 lunar months that repeats itself. Who even knew what a lunar month was? Now, based on some of the calendric information that was found on the inscriptions, there was yet another proposal that this thing was actually created in 205 BC, but that's still controversial. Now, the back door to the mechanism has a sort of instruction manual on it, and this is what references those 235 months of the metonic cycle, those are lunar months, as well as 223 lunar months of the sorrow cycle and the 76 years of the calyptic cycle. Now, I don't even know what any of that means, so let's just move on. In addition, there have been all kinds of recent dives at the site throughout the 2010s, with the most recent one being in 2022. And these did uh, all kinds of modern surveying and scanning to really map the seabed and the whole wreck site. And there have been some additional finds worth mentioning. They found a nearby wreck. They found additional wooden planking from the hull. They found parts of an anchor and other fitting from the rigging. They found bronze spears and statues, uh, pieces of a marble statue, including a hand, a gold ring, glass and ceramic containers, including amphora, a mysterious bronze disc depicting a bull, which was initially thought to be part of the mechanism, but turned out not to be, a marble object believed to be part of a sarcophagus, even human remains, including a skeleton. One of the coolest finds was an ancient naval weapon called a dolphin, which is a, basically a giant lead bulb with an iron spike on it. It weighed 220 pounds or 100 kilos. Now, this was meant to be dropped on an enemy ship in order to pierce the hull, but it was not believed that that's what led to this ship sinking. In 2022, Archaeologists got permission to remove uh, some large boulders that were littering the wreck site. And once they did this, they actually found human teeth. Now, what's so cool about that is teeth actually can yield tons of information, which is now going to be coming out, uh, particularly isotopic information, which can tell us about where people were from, where they grew up, and what sort of illnesses they may have had. So as you can see, this is still really very much an active site. And you can also see how complex a site like this is. We have the marine archaeologists doing the diving. We have dendrochronologists. We have the 
folks that do carbon dating. We have bioarchaeologists. We have archaeoastronomers. So this kind of a complex site involves so many subdisciplines of archaeology and related sciences. Now, some food for thought is how such a site would be treated today. Currently, pretty much universally accepted archaeological principles are that sites and materials should be left in situ unless it's threatened by something like development, which this ship would not be. So chances are, if this was found today, it would actually be left at the bottom of the ocean. And I wonder if that's always the best thing, as I'm someone who wants the public to be able to appreciate the archaeology. In fact, modern international law, namely UNESCO's Convention on Underwater Her Cultural Heritage, actually enshrines this principle that stuff is supposed to be left in situ uh, unless specifically threatened. And yet, if you want to display something underwater to the public, the act of raising it actually is a threat because it's very, very fragile. And if it's not very, 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 very carefully preserved, the stuff could be ruined. You're going to see more of this later in my visit to the Hunley in Charleston, South Carolina. So in other words, leaving something at the bottom of the ocean might actually be the best way to preserve it. So there's some food for thought. Now, as you'll see in my site visit series, one of my favorite things to do is actually visit these archaeological sites. And because this one is underwater, first of all, you can't really visit it. And even if I was there, I couldn't do it because I can't dive. I've had a bunch of surgeries on my sinuses. And for that reason, I cannot scuba dive because I can't equalize. Yeah, bitter party of one. But anyway, even though you can't visit the site, you can see the mechanism. And that was one of the coolest experiences of my archaeological life. The mechanism, along with a lot of the other stuff uh, found from the shipwreck, is on display at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, and you should definitely check it out. First of all, it's a place to get away from the crowds at the Acropolis, and when it's hot as fuck out like it was this summer, it's a great place to cool off. Definitely one of the best museum experiences I've ever had, and I totally recommend going there. You can find some of the modern reconstructions of the Antikythera mechanism in institutions around the world, such as the American Computer Museum in Bozeman, Montana, of all places, and the Manhattan Children's Museum in New York City. Well, my brain is about to explode from all that sciencing, and I'm, I'm pretty hot and bothered at this point. Ooh, is the camera lens fogged up there? Anyway, stay tuned for the next episode of Archaeology Porn when I take a revealing look at the Nefertiti bust. Bye for now. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.